Good morning. We're good to see everyone here this morning. So glad that everyone made it out. Thank those who were present yesterday at the chili cook-off. Had a good time. It was not as cold as I thought it was going to be, which was good. It was still a little cool, but glad everyone who made it did so and hope everyone enjoyed your time there. I do want to keep David in our prayers continually and we pray that he can get everything under control and be back with us soon. This morning, the lesson that we're going to talk about, that I've entitled, You Hold the Answer. Each and every one of us are free moral agents. We make choices in our lives, and it's very easy in our lives to blame other people for those choices. And there are times when we don't want to take responsibility, we want to put it off on someone else. When in reality, it's us. And it's on us for the choices and the decisions we make. We have the ability and the responsibility to choose between two or more alternatives in life. We come upon, as we say very often, a crossroads. And crossroads in life causes us to make some decisions, sometimes hard decisions. But they have to be made. Sometimes we wonder, well, am I making the right decision or the wrong decision? Sometimes those choices are hard. But the decision we make can affect us for the rest of our lives. It could affect us even into eternity. That's why we have to stop and think without making rash decisions or decisions just on the fly, as some people say, well, I've got to do this and I've got to make a decision right now. Most decisions can be made with thought. Matter of fact, all of them can be made with thought, but with time. I know we do make quick decisions occasionally, but most of the decisions you will make in your life and I will make in my life, we have time to think about that and determine what we want to do. So today I want to talk about the and give careful consideration of the fact that we have choices to make. And in looking at those choices, especially moral choices in this world, and particularly the way we see the world going today, what are we going to do? How are we going to react when things happen to us and Will we make the right decisions? Well, I want to go back to the Old Testament, look at Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. We'll read that passage, those two short verses, where Joshua challenged Israel concerning who they will serve. And he was telling them, you have to make a choice. And he wasn't forcing them to do something. He didn't force them to say and tell them, you're going to do what I tell you to do. He told them what God wanted them to do and then they had to make the decision themselves whether or not they were going to follow the choice that they knew was right or they were going to choose what pleased them. In Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15, we can read, And now therefore the fear of the Lord, and serve him with sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. He's telling them what to do. In verse 15, he gives them the choice. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day who you will serve, whether the gods that your fathers served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whom land you that you dwell. But then Joshua tells what he's going to do. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, they were at a crossroads, and he had to tell the Israelites, here's what you should do. You should be serving God, but if you think it's evil to serve God, make a choice and stick with your choice. You can serve these gods that were on the other side of the flood, serve the gods of the Amorites whose land you dwell, but he said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do and my family is going to do. We're going to serve the Lord. Now, what are you going to do? That still rings true with all of us today. Every single person here knows the Bible says serve the Lord. And every single person in this world who believes anything about God should know to serve Him. Sadly, we live in a world that, that today people say, well, I believe in God and I love God, but I don't have to serve Him. I believe I dealt a little bit with that last week in the lesson. But we have to make the choice. So what's that choice going to be? Again, you hold the answer to your life to your choices, and I do the same for my life and my choices. 
But what are some of the most important questions that we, you and I both personally, will have to answer? Well, first of all, have you been saved? And we're talking about spiritual salvation. We see people that are in car wrecks and people that have accidents, their house burns, or, or they, they deal with some tragedy, and they say, well, was that person saved? We're talking about physically on those, in those areas. But what we want to concern ourselves with this morning is, are you saved spiritually? That's the most important thing that we will do in our life is to be saved. That's going to be the most important decision a person can ever make. Not, well, I'm safe from this. If you're on Facebook and now it's become a joke, I'm safe today from and pick whatever the meme is for the day or whatever the political thing is that they make the meme from. I'm marked safe today and has a little blue flag on it from whatever. Well, we need to know what the Bible says are we marked safe from hell because we go obey the gospel and become a Christian? It's certain that the Heavenly Father, His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit who has given us the word wants us to be saved. As a matter of fact, we can read what Paul wrote Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, where he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be saved. He said he will have all men to be saved. The Greek word here for who will have means he desires. That's what he wants. Matter of fact, in Thayer's defini definition from his English-Greek lexicon, it tells us, and part of that definition is, it's a desire. God desires us. He wants us to be saved. He's not going to make us do anything. Again, that goes back to the very first statement I made in, in the introduction. We're free moral agents. We make the choice of what we want to do. And with that free moral agency, we can choose to be saved or we can choose to be lost. But God's desire is that we are saved. That we become a Christian. We live a Christian life that we can be in heaven with him. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, Peter wrote, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want to see anyone lost. Are there going to be lost people? Absolutely. Why are there going to be lost people? Because some people don't care about God. They don't care about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. They don't care about the word, the Holy Bible that was given through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They just care about what they want to do. But he doesn't want that to happen. He wants to see all men come to a knowledge of the truth. But again, that goes back to free moral agency. You have to make that decision, or I have to make that decision. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 Paul telling the Romans when he wrote them, he said, And the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. Through the inspired word that the Holy Spirit gave, he tells us as he bears with us that he wants us to be saved when we submit to the will of God through the word. Then there are other people that want us to be saved. We should want to be saved ourselves, but we have family and friends who would like to see us saved, those who are already Christians. When they see family members who are not saved, when they see friends who are not Christians, we desire them to be saved, don't we? And we do what we can by teaching them, by setting a good, proper Christian example in front of them, by living the life that a Christian should be living. Now, the world tells us today, as long as you tell somebody you believe in Christ or to tell somebody you are a Christian, no matter how you live, that's not what the Bible teaches, folks. The Bible teaches us in 1 John 1, verse 7, if you, if, it's a key word there, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. See, there's a conditional statement of if. 
What does it mean to walk in the light? It means to live a faithful Christian life doing exactly what the Bible tells us to do. I'm hearing more and more people say, well, the Bible's not really that important. As long as you claim to serve Jesus, as long as you say you love Jesus, then that's all that matters. The Bible's not important. Folks, the Bible is important. That's our roadmap to heaven. That's the only way we're ever going to get to heaven is studying and obeying the Bible. And if we don't obey the Bible, then we're going to be lost. Because the Bible teaches that throughout from cover to cover. God, from Genesis to Revelation, and every single thing that's taught from Old Testament to New Testament, from patriarchal, mosaical, and Christian age, the theme of the whole Bible is obedience to God and faithfulness to Him. Yet today the world doesn't think that that's that important. But the Bible still tells us it is. And we make the decision. We have to make the choice. Some have unwisely turned from the only means of obtaining spiritual salvation. A few examples in the Bible I want to look at first. Back in the book of Acts chapter 24. We find that you had Felix at one point in Acts 24 and 25. And it tells us, and he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered, go thy way at this time. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. Paul was standing before giving a defense supposedly of his life, but he gave a defense of the gospel. And in preaching to these people, he had Felix unnerved. He said Felix trembled. He was shaking. He was scared to death because Paul told him, in so many words, you're going to lose your soul. He reasoned with him with righteousness, righteousness and temperance and patience and judgment to come. When he told Felix these things and, and explaining about the judgment, Paul had to preach to Felix to tell him he's going to be lost. And he trembled. It should make a person tremble. When a person realizes they're lost and they're not going to make it to heaven, they should be scared to death. But notice Felix's response. Instead of like the jailer in Philippi in Acts 16 who said, what must I do to be saved? Felix said, go on, Paul, go, go away. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. Felix wasn't willing to give up the lifestyle he was living and stop doing the things he was doing that was against God and his word. And you know that's the last thing we hear about Felix as far as his salvation is concerned. We don't read anywhere where he had Paul come back and teach him further where he could obey the gospel. He made his choice. Then you have Agrippa in Acts 26, verses 27 and 28. And Paul asked King Agrippa, Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. Now there's discussion among scholars whether he's saying that in derision. Huh, you think you're almost going to make me a Christian? I don't know that I personally believe that part of it. It seems to me to indicate in all the things that we read, very likely, he was saying, you almost persuaded me to do this. He was thinking about it, but he didn't do it. Those who obey the gospel and who have obeyed the gospel have made the right decision. I think a good example of that is found in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Those people who are pricked in the hearts in verse 37 after Peter preaching to them, convicted them and told them they murdered the Son of God and put Him on the cross. And then they asked the question in verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Here are people who then had faith. They believed Jesus was Son of God. He told them in verse 38, To repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 41, it tells us that they that gladly received the word were baptized and added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. Those people who believed changed their lives in repentance. They were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins where they contacted the blood of Jesus. 
And it tells us in verse 41, they were added to the church. Verse 47 tells us that the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So those who were saved were added to the church. Those who were added to the church were the ones who were saved. And how were they saved? When they obeyed the gospel through their faith, repentance, and their baptism. They were added to the church. Their sins were washed away. And we can know whether or not that we're saved by adhering to the teaching of God's Word. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, we can read, And hereby we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. I have people and I've heard people say, Well, I know Jesus. If you know Jesus, it tells me that you keep His commandments, right? That's what the Bible tells us. And he goes on, he says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth's not in him. There's your telltale sign. If a person says, I know Jesus, and they're not keeping the commandments of Christ, they're lying to people. It's what God said. The truth's not in them. That's not me standing up here saying it. I am, but I'm telling you what the Bible says. That's in 1 John chapter 2, and verse 2 and 3. You go on further in verses 4 and 5, but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we're in him. If we want to know we're in Christ and in God, we're keeping his commandments. We're doing what the Bible teaches us. Proverbs 28 verse 26, though, tells us a totally different story. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. If we trust in our own heart, we're foolish. Our own heart leads us astray. When we start thinking about what makes us feel good and what we like and what we want, we're going away from what God said. And it's foolish to do so. But he said those who are wise, which means those who are keeping his commandments, those who are doing what God's told us to do through his word, said so this person's a wise person. But next... Totally switching gears because we all make decisions. And we live in a world today full of anxiety. We live in a world today full of all sorts of medicines that people take. And I'm not discounting medicines because they're needed and they're good when you do need them. They have benefits. But we, we live in a world today where anxiety is just rampant in the world. Just a few weeks ago, David preached a lesson about that, about being anxious. And I hope that we all heard that and understand that we do have responsibility not to let everything in this life worry us and bother us. There are things happening in our life that, that do bother us that are somewhat irritating. And once we get over that initial irritation or the initial shock, and when things happen because as humans a lot of times we say, well, why this and why that? Then we start realizing that God's blessed us. And things we deal with in this life are just temporary anyway. So let me ask the question, is your life going to be a happy life? Is my life going to be a happy life? I ask myself that question. Happiness cannot be bought, begged, borrowed, or stolen. Happiness is within the reach of each and every one of us. But again, we make that choice as free moral agents. Do you want to live a happy life or do you want to live a miserable life? I know some people, I think they're happy to be miserable. <laughs> The more miserable they are and the more miserable they make other people, I think the happier they are. I know it doesn't make sense. But that's just the way it seems. They're actually really miserable people. But they get pleasure out of making other people miserable because they're miserable. And I guess they must feel like, well, if I'm miserable, I'm going to make everybody around me that way too. Well, same is true with happiness. If we live a happy life and a productive life in this world, we can make other people happy. We can show people not only the joys in this life, but most importantly the joys of heaven and the joys of Christianity. There are many people that pursue the wrong avenues of happiness, though, which often brings headache, heartache, unhappiness that we really don't want or need. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 28 Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What profit is it? What reward is it if we gain everything in this world and we lose our soul in hell? What profit has it been to us for all of that? 
There are some people who are trying to reach the heights of fame and or fortune. Some people want to be famous. They tell you, I'm going to be this and I'm going to be that. There's nothing wrong with achieving goals. But to be famous for famous sake is really wrong. And I say that because if a person wants to be famous just so they can be recognized throughout the world, that's an arrogant, haughty attitude. The Bible teaches against pride and arrogance. There are people like that. There are people out there that said, I'm going to be the richest person in, in this city or this county or this state or the world. And they have more money than I, I heard growing up than since. A lot of them don't, I mean, you got some common sense for business, but common sense for life, a lot of people don't have that because they're achieving their wrong goals for happiness. Now, when a person achieves wealth and they're living a Christian life, that's great. God's blessed them. But when people go to the point that all they think about is money, 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 I don't care about anything else, family, friends, God, the Bible, then something's wrong. But the Lord does want us to be happy. Some people live a miserable life, but God has given us the prescription. I talked about taking medicines a minute ago. God gives us a prescription. And that prescription is obey his word. And we can live a happy life by living a Christian life and doing what God's told us in his word. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12, Jesus says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Rejoice, be happy, and be exceeding glad in your life. Why? Because you're doing God's will. Matthew 5, 12 is the follow-up from beginning of verse 6 in the Beatitudes. The blessed are they that do this and that. We're not going to go through all of them right now. But the Bible tells us how to be blessed. And that word blessed in the Greek means happy. How can you be happy? By following what he said in the Beatitudes and the rest of the New Testament. True happiness, though, comes from obedience to the Lord and having a close relationship with God. In Psalm 144, 15, it says, Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. After the Ethiopian, Philip uh, baptized him, Acts chapter 8, and when he went to the water, he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. They came up out of the water, and what does the Bible say? That he went on his way rejoicing. He was happy that he had been saved. But happiness does not depend upon material possessions. Luke 12, 15 tells us, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Our life does not consist with what we possess. Some people want to get in a contest. Oh, look at my car I've got. Oh, you think you got something? Let me show you the one I've got. And you can do that with anything, any material possession. Somebody's always going to one-up somebody else. Oh, you've got that. I've got a better one. That doesn't bring happiness. And it does not depend upon what we own to make us happy. Then next, are you going to have friends? All of us should want friends. Again, going back, some people are so grumpy, you wonder if they ever want them or not. But we should want friends. It's necessary for us to be friends in order to have friends. We have to show ourselves friendly. If we walk around with a sour look on the face all the time and growl and grumble at everybody we come around or come across, we're not going to have very many friends. And we see that in the world. You probably have co-workers that are like that. You may have friends and family that are like that. <laughs> but that, I say friends, they, they may be more of an acquaintance than a friend because if they grumble all the time, you probably don't want to be around them. I don't. I don't want to be around people that grumble, complain, and moan, and gripe about everything there is in this world. But there are people that do that. 
But if we're going to be friends, we have to show ourselves friendly. And we should want friends. Really, as Christians, our Christian family should be our closest friends. Just for the fact that we have done exactly what the Bible's told us in being saved through that obedience to the gospel, to have our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, living a faithful Christian life, we should be the closest friends ever. But then we do have those other friends. And our family should be our friends as well, as long as they want to be friendly. you got family members probably, and I know I do, that you don't want to be friends with because they're not friendly. We deal with that a lot in my line of work. We come across different calls and families squabble and fuss and fight and can't get along. They won't talk to each other just because somebody's not friendly. But we can have friends. And Proverbs 18.24 says, Man that hath friends must show himself friendly. People are attracted to a person who is thoughtful and unselfish in nature. When you look at Philippians 2.4, Paul told the Philippians, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We don't, we're not selfish people. We're not looking out just for ourselves. We're looking out for others. When you're willing to look out for other people, you have true friends and you are a true friend. And as Christians, we should want the best for each other. We should want all of us to be in heaven together. So when that great day comes on the day of judgment, we hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. We can be in heaven with each other and with God worshiping around the throne of God and rejoicing that we're there. But next, in our choices of life, what will each of us do to help the church grow spiritually and even numerically? As I mentioned about selfish people earlier, they look at what they can get out of something, what they can do and what, what's going to help them, not anybody else. They're self-centered and they're not looking for the interests of others or giving consideration on how they personally can benefit the church. I'm glad we don't see that here. In a lot of churches you don't, but there are some churches you do see that. I see us as a group that we have the best interest for each other in, in mind and heart. I see us that as a congregation that we enjoy being together. I think yesterday proved that that we have those opportunities to come together outside of worship to socially enjoy one another's company, to visit with one another. We have that with our potlucks. We can sit around and talk to each other. We can encourage each other. We need to continue those things. In Acts 5.42, we can read, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus. Those folks on the day of Pentecost and they obeyed the gospel, that's following verse 41 where those that gladly received the word were baptized and added unto the church that day about 3,000 souls. And he continues by saying, and daily in the temple. Those people who were saved and added to the church daily in the temple. And that's something that they did in, under that system which they lived. They went to the temple daily to pray. So you can imagine everybody going into a temple and they're praying, they're congregating, they're seeing, seeing each other, and they're encouraging each other, they're helping each other. I know we meet physically once a week, two services, and virtually once a week, for, well, twice a week, those who are in the Godhead class, we can study the Word together. Because of my work, I'm not able to get on a lot because we're dealing with a lot of calls. But when we're not, I try to sign on when I'm out just patrolling around and listen to the lesson. And it's encouraging. And it's also encouraging before and after all the conversations going on, how everybody's doing, what's going on, and, and different people interacting and talking. That's good. Since we can't be together at times physically, we still have those opportunities of communication that we can enjoy one another. Then next, will we strive to keep the church sound in the faith? Some people say, well, what does that matter? True Christians don't, but people in the world do. Well, as long as you, you have a church, everybody has some ideas. But we need to keep the church sound in the faith. What does that mean? 
Well, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. What are sound words? What does he mean when he talks about sound words? Those things that are truthful. Those things that are those words that will build one another up in the most holy faith. Those things that are right. Unsound words. Just the opposite. Those things that hurt us. Those things that, that will keep us out of heaven. So when he tells us to hold fast a form, a pattern of sound words, he tells us there's a pattern to follow. And it's words that are sound, that are faithful, that are righteous, that are right and whole wor wholesome words. The truth. And that's all, all we're boiling down to here. When he talks about sound words, he's talking about the truth. And we have to follow the truth. Whether it's an individual or a congregation as a collective body, we can't depart from the faith overnight. That happens gradually. When people start getting their own ideas about one subject and then it goes on to another subject or another idea that they come up with from something they've heard or something they've read and they start departing from the old paths of righteousness, righteousness to the broad way of destruction because, again, it goes back to becoming selfish and they're selfish one in their own way. And when people want his or her own way, then they depart from those sound words. But when we strive to keep the church sound in the faith, we're not doing that. We're sticking with what the Bible teaches us. We're living a faithful life and we're encouraging others to do that. And if we hear somebody teaching something that's unsound, then we have to correct them and rebuke them for what they're doing to get them back on that path of righteousness so they'll speak sound words again. Today that's unloving and harsh in some people's mind, but it's not. It's loving to pull somebody out of the fire. If somebody fell in the physical fire, would you want to pull them out or watch them burn? Oh, well, I might burn myself. I can't do that. Good luck to you. Maybe you'll get out. No, if we're going to do what we should do, if it was in a physical sense, you're going to pull that person out of the fire. You're going to try to save them. Well, when a person goes off the pathway of righteousness spiritually, we want to save them and bring them back. We have to redirect them. We do that with children, don't we? When a child does something he or she shouldn't do, we redirect them. That redirecting could be instruction because discipline comes in two forms, instructive discipline and corrective discipline. If a child particularly who doesn't know something does something wrong, you instruct them, here, you did this wrong, here's how you should do it or here's what you should do. You're redirecting them to the pathway of right, whether it's a school assignment or teaching the Bible. You're trying to get them to learn the right way and the right thing. Same thing spiritually. When a person leaves the faith, we have to redirect them, and that comes sometime in a sharp or strong rebuke. Sometimes it's just instructing them, hey, do you realize you did this and this is not right? We still have that responsibility to bring them back to the faith. Then finally, are we making preparations to go to heaven? Again, that's a choice that we have to make. Do we want to go to heaven? Most everybody will say, yes, I do. Well, what preparations are we making? If you ever go on a trip, and we need to realize life's a trip, life is a journey, if you ever go on a vacation somewhere, or maybe a business trip, whatever it is, you're going to pack you some clothes. Let's say you got a week-long vacation or a week-long business trip. You're going to pack your clothes or you're just going to put your phone in your pocket and make sure you got a little cash with you and you just, whatever you got on, that's what you're going to take and go. No, you're going to prepare, aren't you? You're going to plan ahead. You're going to get everything ready that you need to take with you. You're going on a vacation, you're going to pack whatever's necessary for your vacation. Haul your suitcases out to your vehicle, throw them in there. If you're going to drive, you're driving. If you're not, you take it to the airport and let them take care of it and hope they don't lose it. And when you get where you're going, you get to your luggage and then you go on your merry way and your vacation. You make preparations, though. That's the point. You don't just, by the seat of your pants, just jump up and say, well, I think I'm going to go to Africa today. Walk into the uh, airport and say, hey, give me a plane ticket, Africa. What part? I don't care, just somewhere in Africa. Where's your luggage? Didn't bring any. People don't do that. At least a wise person doesn't do that. You plan ahead and make 
everything ready. You make the preparations for that. Well, our life's a journey. We make preparations for heaven as well. Every single human being is going to one of two places. It's either heaven or hell. There's no in-between. And on the great day of judgment, the eternal destiny of every individual will be declared and we will go to one of those two places. In Matthew 25, 46, those on the left hand that Jesus has just said, you didn't feed me when I was hungry, clothe me when I was naked and destitute, you didn't take care of my daily needs. And he said, and these shall go away in everlasting punishment. But the righteous in the life eternal. The righteous are those on the right who took care of the food, the clothing, necessities. And he's giving those examples in those previous verses of what one should be doing for others. The righteous, those who did what was right, who made the preparations, will go into life eternal. The Lord has gone to prepare a place for his faithful, obedient children. John 14, 1 through 3, the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place, I'll come again to receive you unto myself. The where I am, there you may be also. Jesus has told us, I've gone to prepare a place for you. But it's a prepared place for a prepared people. He made the preparations for heaven for us. And we have to prepare ourselves to go there. So let me ask the question as we close. If you died in your present spiritual state, would heaven be your home? Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Those two verses teach us that the majority of the people are going to the broad way of destruction. The majority of the people leaving this world are going to lose their soul. Why? Because they don't love God enough to follow Him. They did not make the right choices in life they continue to make bad choices and they continue to stay away from God and his word in order to go to heaven in that straight and narrow way that leads to life we have to be prepared we have to make the right choice if you not already obey the gospel don't you think it's about time you did in Hebrews 5 8 the Bible tells us Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all of them that obey him we must obey Jesus if you through hearing the word of God have believed that Jesus is the son of God and you're willing to make changes in your life in repentance, you can confess Jesus with the mouth. Do you believe he is the son of God? And through that confession, you can be immersed in baptism where Jesus' blood was shed in his death. And in Romans 6, 3 and 4 tells us that we're baptized into that death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should rise to walk in newness of life. That verse tells us that when one is baptized into Christ, he's baptized into his death where his blood was shed. We reach his blood and his blood is what saves us. As we come up out of the water, according to Romans 6, 4, we'll rise out of it to walk in newness of life. If you compare those two verses, it tells us you go down an old man, you come up anew. So you can do that today if you haven't. Having done that, if you're not living a Christian life, maybe you've made some bad choices in life. All of us have. But when we repent of those sins, God forgives us. But it may be choices in your life you haven't repented of. Maybe you're living a life right now that is not in harmony with God's Word. You're given an opportunity to make things right with God. And we offer you that opportunity right now. Why together we stand and why we sing.